Thank you for attending this meeting. My name is Ariel Arrier, and I'm the president of Stressmark Biosciences based in Victoria, Canada. The title of this talk is Fibular and Oligomeric Constructs for Neurodegenerative Disease Modeling. Now, by way of introduction, we'll be looking at some of the key elements surrounding alpha synuclein and tau, as well as the constructs that we make in the form of fibrils, filaments, and oligomers. We'll then spend a little bit of time looking at some of the conjugates that we've made of those fibrils and their utility followed by some conclusions. Now, alpha synuclein is a relatively small 15 kilodalton protein whose physiological function is not well understood. It can act as a prion-like protein and can generate large families of oligomers and fibrils. These are toxic to cells and can be processed by them by virtue of C-terminal truncation. They can also go to generate Lewy bodies and neurites. Synucleinopathies is a term that has been given to alpha-synuclein related diseases that have no known cure. The process by way alpha-synuclein aggregates is shown here in this slide cited from the reference below. Alpha-synuclein monomers shown in green on the left interact with membranes which then results in a change in structure. This is also related to the macromolecular crowding, any mutations that may be present, such as the familial A53T mutant truncation that we just talked about in terms of C-terminal truncation, as well as the environment. And this goes on to form a pool of alpha-synuclein oligomers. They can be different in size, morphology, and characteristics. These will have a subpopulation that are able to go on to form protofibrils, which at this stage are still soluble and they can then go on to form mature fibrils. These last three constructs are all thought to be part of the pathological conditions we see in disease. In terms of the toxicity mechanisms associated with alpha-synuclein, these are not well understood. From a synapse perspective, alpha-synuclein is known to be associated with presynaptic vessels. In fact, alpha-synuclein after aggregation can adopt pore-like structures which can disrupt vesicles as well as membrane integrity. From a trafficking perspective, GRP78 is known to be upregulated during enhanced alpha-synuclein exposure, while mitochondria can undergo depolarization. Furthermore, when monomeric alpha-synuclein is subjected to dopamine treatment, it can go on to form dopamine-induced oligomers, which are very toxic. This slide shows the alpha-synuclein aggregate presence in Lewy bodies and urites. Initially thought to be 100% full of alpha-synuclein protein, it has now turned out that these have a variety of other aggregated proteins present in them, as well as vesicles, membranes, and organelles. This GIF movie shows the evolution and structure whilst an alpha-synuclein molecule is undergoing aggregation. It starts as an alpha helical structure, which goes through a variety of different changes depending on its environment, and ends with a beta sheet structure shown here. Why is this important? The screen shows you a reaction of alpha synuclein aggregation monitored by THT. THT is a compound that binds directly to beta sheet but not alpha helix. So as the transformation proceeds, more and more THT is able to bind the evolving beta sheet and we can monitor the reaction in vitro. If you were to try to inhibit this reaction, i.e. to introduce compounds that might be aggregation inhibitors, this would make a very simple assay to use as you would want to flatten or disrupt the blue curve altogether. Tau, from an introductory perspective, is also a small protein, about 46 kilodaltons in size, and has multiple isoforms in humans. 
It stabilizes and promotes the assembly of microtubules in neurons and is responsible, therefore, for the health of that neuron. It can also act in a prion-like manner, just like alpha-synuclein, but phosphorylation is key to its outcome. When it undergoes phosphorylation, this results in the transformation of normal tau into paired helical filament tau, known as PHF tau, and ultimately neurofibrillary tangles, which may be toxic to cells. We generally work with the 2N4R construct, which is full size, although we will also work with the K18 construct, which essentially is the R1 to R4 piece of the wild type sequence. This schematic shows how tau is involved in the health of the neurons. In the top insert, you see the microtubules with associated tau present in a healthy cell. As the tau becomes hyperphosphorylated, it leaves the microtubule, which is then disrupted, and goes on to form these paired helical filaments and neurofibrillary tangles. The disruption of those microtubules, which is core to the health of the cell by transporting nutrients to their destinations, is disrupted. And as a result of that, the cells die. In terms of the sort of constructs that we make, we have a variety of different types of monomers. Cited here is type 1 and type 2, which unsurprisingly go on to form type 1 and type 2 fibrils. From the oligomeric perspective, we do have various constructs here too, but they're generally seen as spherical, approximately 25 nanometers in diameter, but can also have the um, morphology of a small twisted pig-like tail. Filaments, which are generally regarded as still being protofibrils and soluble in nature, are also available and look very much under EM like mature fibrils. Fibrils themselves um, are one of the larger areas in, from a product perspective, where we have type 1, type 2, and type 3, both mouse and human fibrils, um, the familial Parkinson's mutant A50, A53T mutant, and all of these have different properties from each other. If we just look from an EM perspective here, a type 1, type 2, A53T fibrils and filaments, there's not much between them. To the unpracticed eye, they all look like fibrils. However, they have quite different properties. So let's examine some of those. In this reaction, this is a typical seeded alpha-synuclein reaction, we see the purple line, very similar to the last slide that we looked at in terms of the aggregation kinetics. And this is the result of a type 1 seeded assay. So type 1 monomer with type 1 fibril. We get a large THT response due to the binding of THT to those type 1 fibrils. However, if we do exactly the same thing under the same conditions with the same concentrations with a type 2 fibril seeded reaction, the outcome is in light blue. So the signal is about four to five times less. This is one of the key indicators and differences between the two types of fibrils, type 1 and type 2. Type 3 fibrils we're not going to spend any time on today, but they're essentially a merge between type 1 and type 2 in terms of properties. If we take type 1 fibrils or type 2 fibrils and we inject them into rat primary neurons, and look for the evolution of pathology measured using an antibody to phosphoserine 129 shown here in green, we see a tremendous difference in the evolution of that pathology. On the left-hand side, with type 1 fibrils, we see a lot of pathology generated. And on the right-hand side, we see essentially no pathology generated. Another key hallmark of the differences between type 1 and type 2 fibrils. If we take A53T mutant fibrils and introduce them to Shy 5 cells, we see using a total alpha synuclein antibody a large amount of aggregation that takes place, followed almost immediately by cell death, mirrored also in the phosphoserine 129 uh, pathology shown in red below it. On the other hand, if we take just the filaments known in the literature not to be uh, toxic or induce seeding, we see exactly that. 
there is almost no change in the phosphoserine 129 signal shown in the top panel, and the cells remain relatively healthy. If we look at alpha-synuclein oligomers, they look a little bit different. On the left-hand side, you can see the dopamine-induced oligomers, and on the right-hand side, EGCG oligomers. They look relatively similar, about 25 nanometers across or so, and globular in their structures. They tend to be relatively toxic compared to fibrils, as we will see. However, in terms of their populations, you can see on this slide the dopamine oligomers are present at approximately the size of 1.1 million Daltons, or about 80 monomeric units together. One interesting aspect of the oligomers is not only that they do not seed, shown here in comparison to a monomer self-seeding on its own in blue, but particularly interesting is the fact that they remove the self-seeding of the monomers alone. So in red, you see oligomer seeds, or olig oligomer, alpha-synuclein oligomers present, with the monomer. And although you see a small increase in the level of THT, it is nothing compared to the self-seeding of alpha-synuclein monomer on its own in blue. When present in CHI-5 cells, alpha-synuclein oligomers show an enhanced toxicity. And you can see here that the cells die in the bottom panel, but on the top panel you can also begin to see that there's really very, very little change in terms of the phosphoserine 129 pathology. So to look at this in more detail, some experiments were performed by QPS in Austria, and you can see in the two inserts that we're looking at a variety of different constructs, uh, including controls, and our fibrils do show in, in both panels some element of to toxicity. However, the oligomers on the far right-hand side of each insert with both the MTT and the LVH assays show considerably more toxicity than any of the fibrils. This is also consistent with the literature. Taking this a step further, if we take the fibrils and move to the in vivo stage, and these are injected directly into uh, mouse or rat brains, you can see the evolution of phosphoserine 129 pathology throughout the brain. This is important because it's not just at the injection site, but is transmitted across the brain onto both sites. This, these images were taken after just 30 days of injection. And it's also worth bearing in mind that these are not transgenic animals. Moving on to tau, you can see two different types of tau aggregates, again, the 2N4R construct on the left and the K18 on the right. From a morphological perspective, you can see the one on the left is more branched and the one on the right less so. Our aim is to make these as useful as possible as tools for neurodegenerative research, and that aim means that we want to try to make something that is akin as possible to what we see in human disease. This is followed by the fact that the K18 alone can induce pathology in vivo, and we see that here at the injection site, which is work performed by the CRO Remind in Belgium. If we take the larger construct, the 2N4R, and introduce it to SHI-5 cells, we can see in the top panel using a total tau antibody that aggregation is quite aggressive and that cell death follows relatively quickly. If we look for the phospho signal at 202 and 205, otherwise known as the 88 site, we don't really see any increase, although this could be due to the toxicity of the fibrils. One of the hallmarks of what we see in human disease, and particularly in Alzheimer's that tau is associated with, are paired helical filaments. K280 mutants are known in the literature to spontaneously generate paired helical filaments. And you can see that on the left-hand side, although it's not terribly clear, but in some cases you can see that there are paired um, elements in terms of some of these structures. 
we can also show on the right hand side that these structures are capable of seeding themselves, so are active. If we drill down even further and look just at the 100 amino acids or so that are directly involved in creating the core of the fibrils for tau, we have two constructs there that are very similar, they're referred to as the DGAE constructs. In both cases, they form fibrils and are both seeding capable. So if there was interest in trying to disrupt the very core aspects of fibril formation, these would be very useful tools to use. Taking it again a step further and trying to get closer and closer to those paired helical filaments, you can see on the left-hand side, the full-length tau that is grown on a linear, natural anionic scaffold. And again, the twisted, helical formation of these becomes more and more clear. Again, taking it even a step further by expressing these systems in baculovirus so that the post-translational modifications are present, in this case in over 38 phospho-sites, these entities will spontaneously aggregate without any help and are also seeding capable. Finally, we want to look at some of the conjugates, and this is work done by Selectricon in Sweden using a microfluidic system that they use. Uh, this is uh, within um, the framework of a 384 well plate, uh, where each well represents one chamber. And you can see here two chambers that are joined by short um, channels. In chamber two, neuronal growth is introduced, or cells are, in, are introduced and grown for seven days. These then will grow across those channels and into chamber one, where alpha-synuclein fibrils are directly introduced. But these alpha-synuclein fibrils are dilabeled so that we can see them. Um, and then we look for the uptake and the transport across the neurons back into the neuronal cell bodies, where we would identify them and look for any pathology generated. And this is exactly what we see. Initially, we see the uptake of the alpha-synuclein fibrils in chamber one and through retrograde transport down the etched channels towards chamber two. And then most importantly, we can see that in the cell bodies, in exactly the same place, we can identify the pathology that is generated using the green signal of the phosphorylated phosphoserine 129 protein. And it correlates directly with the seeds that have been transported through there from the first chamber into the second chamber and into the cell body. This shows us not only the uptake and the retrograde transport, but also the initiation of pathology generation in a particular place that coincides with where the seeds have been transported to. In conclusion, therefore, we have monomeric, oligomeric, and filamentous, as well as fibrillar protein constructs with many different properties. Um, this despite being the fact that they're all made from the same protein. We offer a variety of proteins, some of them covered here, but also including, in addition to town alpha synuclein, the beta and gamma synucleins, a transthyretin, as well as SOD. And conjugation allows the fibril to be monitored from several perspectives, including the uptake, the transport, activity, pathology, toxicity, as well as transmission. If you're interested in this, please check out our booth in the virtual exhibition hall. Come by the booth for any pub pamphlets or videos, as well as posters. And if you have any questions, please email uh, the person cited below here, Chelsea Cutler, or have a look at our landing page cited at the bottom. Thank you very much for attending this talk.